So, uh, so should I introduce myself or, or this is uh, someone wants to do that for me, but I can introduce myself. That's not a problem for me. <laughs> Normally, so, we're, we're very liberal in that. So okay, you are it's not formal, yes. It's, we are very informal. Okay, let's stay like this. So I am uh, associate professor at uh, Nicolas Ramirez University in Lithuania, the Villa Sagatiena. And I joined Elpis Network just recently, and I'm happy that I, I can see familiar faces already. This is fantastic to see familiar faces. But of course, I would love uh, to know my audience more before starting my lecture. I am planning to go with the lecture like uh, 30 minutes, but it will be more interactive uh, and I'm not intended to divide the uh, to divide the lecture and the Q&A session. So we will be more like uh, in between and interacting with each other. So welcome everyone. And just, uh, to, of course, this is the um, uh, topic of my uh, presentation. So the genocide in Lithuania from legal history uh, perspective. Why? Uh, I am legal historian originally. Uh, so bachelor and master's in law and my PhD in legal history actually focused on Soviet law and on Soviet judiciary in Lithuania during the occupation. So this is something very interdisciplinary, yes? Law and history, it's, uh, it's already there. So, uh, so uh, research on Soviet genocide I made more than three, now three years ago during my Fulbright at New, in New York in Columbia University. So Soviet genocide topic in Lithuania was always hot, but not in the region. But of course, with the new developments in Ukraine, now this topic is getting more and more attention. And I can see that in, in uh, how many times I already presented that research this season. So not this one, but different angles. But uh, uh, it is a huge demand to know what happened in the region during the Soviet time, during Soviet occupation, not only in Lithuania, but also in, in Ukraine, in Poland, in East Estonia, even in Georgia, in Belarus. What happened there? What, what, was, um, what, was the, what is the background for the current uh, war happening in, happening in Europe? Uh, because if you could see after my lecture that some reasons, some reasons, um, uh, programmed in the uh, in the past in the Soviet time, some unsolved problems led to the war uh, at the moment, uh, Russian war in Ukraine. So you will see that eventually. But uh, I am not uh, rushing you. So uh, I hope you all have your mobile phones by your uh, by your side. So uh, anyone knows what the slider is? Yes. So you either can. Um, picture the QR code or go to slide.com and enter the code. So this is your option. I would love to see, I would love you to connect there because I have like a very simple three questions for you. So let me, uh, let me, let me, let me uh, escape my screen. Okay. So, but still, you can, uh, you should see uh, the slider, and I want to to go to my uh, account and to see how many. Oh, okay. So you are already in the in the section, and I would love you now to see what I am seeing because we will all see what are the results. Okay. So Brazil, Hungary, Germany, uh, Colombia. Nice to meet you. So. What, what else we have? So Greece, welcome on board. So of course, these question, these answers are completely, uh, completely, uh, uh, what to say, uh, not secrets, anonymous. So these are anonymous. And of course, how many, if you will, two persons will write Germany, I will, we will see that more persons are from Germany. So what, what, what we can see, even a person from Russia, this is great because uh, um, it would be very nice to see uh, your uh, opinion on my, on my presentation. Okay, Germany is leading. So uh, how many people are jo have joined? So I have eight people on Slido and how many I have on Zoom? Are those all people what, who are in Zoom are in Slido? Andrea, maybe you can help us. Uh, how many? I'm how many? Not... Sorry? How many on Zoom? How many people we have on Zoom? Uh, 
with me 12. Okay. So, okay, so not uh, everyone uh, joined, but uh, uh, to Slido, but it's, it's okay uh, that uh, Germany, of course, is now leading. So now I know my audience a little bit uh, more. So let me go to the next question. So, okay, uh, now the next question. Lithuania is, I would love you also, again, it, it doesn't need to be very smart or clever or I don't know, this is something what comes to your head when you when you see uh, the the name of a Lithuanian state, Lithuania. I prefer, of course, to say uh, Lithuania. I don't know why, but not I know why because I think that Lithuania is the best, better option than Lithuania. Okay, famous for basketball. So uh, let me guess, maybe someone. Uh, someone from South Americans uh, participants uh, did that because uh, basketball is uh, very good in, in, in very very popular in um, in some of the um, American uh, uh, countries too. Okay, Baltic country famous for basketball. Two participants are still writing, so I have only three persons who uh, contributed. So you can write whatever you want, because I don't know who is writing that and nobody will know who is writing that. Okay, so Baltic country, that's good. You already know the region, uh, what is all about. And uh, of course, you know that um, uh, the region in uh, Baltic countries, there are two more Baltic countries, Estonia and Latvia. Uh, so we are usually go by three. Yes, uh, but uh, Estonia is more and more uh, trying to um, reflect uh, itself as um, uh, reflect itself as a, a northern country so that's fine too so we are somewhere in between yes uh, someone wrote brave china and Ru uh, russia yes the issues with uh, china with russia and russia at the moment are very uh, not disturbing but you know they are challenging and of course, Belarus, you know, that uh, Belarusian opposition leader, uh, Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, is based in Lithuania, actually. So this is something very, um, how to say, it's not brave, I think, it's a necessity. It's, uh, uh, I don't think that Lithuanians are braver for any, uh, any other country or, or any other nationals. Just you know, we uh, we must be that way if we want you know to to proceed if we want to to stay in a free country. So Lithuania is okay, great. So the last question, the last question is this one: Russia is. So what comes to your head when you hear Russia? So this uh, can be again completely. Uh, not fun, not not so smart, not everything. So, okay, where is that? Why I cannot see that anymore? It should be, okay. Okay, Russia is, one person is typing. You all can see what is happening, uh, imperialism. Yes, now is the new word to describe imperialism. I believe that word uh, describe Russia as imperialistic. Because uh, for a period of time uh, after 1990s, it was, you know, how to say, um, that word was, you know, out of vocabulary because, you know, everyone expected that Russia will be uh, become democratic eventually, that it will be decolonized because, you know, the colonization uh, happened de facto, yes, uh, because uh, all the former uh, Soviet occupied states, including Lithuania, decided to go. Uh, to, go, to go their own way, uh, yeah, aggressive. Of course, now in the context of you uh, of the war in, in Ukraine, yes, aggressive. This is uh, very. Can you see that those two words are very uh, linked? Yes, imperialism is usually very aggressive. Yes, largest country in the world. Yes, of course, it's complicated. Yes, aggressive, aggressive, complicated. Um, uh, yes, it's complicated, and um, there are many attempts, a lot of attempts to uh, explain Russia, yes. Uh, but I think that uh, the best experts of Russia are Russians themselves. They really uh, need to figure, or out, figure out who they are and who they want to be. So it looks like we are now in the, in the stage 
when Russia is deciding. I, I don't think that they already decided to be that way. You are, Russia is still deciding, as Belarus is still deciding. Ukraine already decided with the help of Russia at some point, yes? So uh, to be ironic. So this is uh, something what's still happening in Russia and Belarus and already happened in Ukraine. So thank you for, for being with me uh, in those slides. I will uh, come back to my, um, to my slides again and we will start already the conversation. So thank you for contributing uh, because uh, why I did that slide up because I wanted you uh, just you know to get you into the topic what we will be talking about and what region we will be talking about and um, why we will be talking about that region. So let me start with the legal definition of genocide because my topic is Soviet genocide in Lithuania. Yes, what happened from 1940s roughly till 1990s roughly, yes, during the Soviet occupation. So it's over, yes? Now we are talking about legal interpretation of what happened in Lithuania during Soviet time, uh, how to uh, deal with Soviet crimes, how to, you know, how to address those Soviet crimes because nobody, uh, nobody's actually know how to do that. So Lithuania is, the, I, I think the only, uh, in the Baltic states and in the region who was, uh, which was former uh, occupied by Soviet Union uh, that are claiming that Soviet genocide happened. Genocide, like this is legal definition and we are claiming since 1990s when we regained our voice, you know, international voice, independent voice, uh, we started to claim that but not only to claim uh, in a historical level, because many historians uh, can tell you, okay, so the genocide happened in Estonia, so the genocide happened in Poland, whatever, in any other of the country, but what we need to be that uh, um, recognized officially, we need legal, legal recognition, yes? So Lithuania decided to go with the genocide definition and to say, okay, genocide happened in Lithuania. Estonia and Latvia did not. Estonia and Latvia, they, um, uh, they decided to go with the concept of crimes against humanity. Why? Who can tell me why? Does anyone has any idea why Lithuania did uh, claim that Soviet genocide happened and Estonia and Latvia, which experienced very similar things in, in their countries, they decided to go with the crimes against humanity. Have you any clue why that happened? You can guess. So uh, my guess, my guess is uh, uh, two guesses, uh, two answers to that actually. One answer is that it is easier to claim crimes against humanity than genocide. Genocide definition is extremely hard to prove, extremely hard to prove. And uh, that's why I put that legal definition here for you to see for you to see how complicated it is. It contains, you know, genocidal intent. It contains that it can be, genocide can be in part on you know, or in, uh, in whole. Then it can be against different targeted groups. Yes, national, ethnical, racial, religious groups. You cannot see social and political groups. They were excluded actually. Why they were excluded? Because uh, genocide convention was adopted in 1948 and uh, in 1948, you know that Soviet uh, Union was uh, among the winners of World War II and uh, uh, not only Soviet Union, but other countries also made uh, a pressure to exclude social and political groups from that definition. So this is, became extremely hard to prove from legal perspective that genocide happened. So, and you can see many uh, uh, genocidal acts. Yes, actually five of them, killing members of the group uh, and any other, any other action. So today uh, in the context of Lithuania, we will be speaking about genocide in part against national group by killing that national group. So that's why this part is in red. So in Lithuania, we decided to go with this and um, with this definition. So since 1990s, 
So can you see uh, the picture um, of the some handwriting? Yes, and you can see the word actually had genocide written in, in the picture. So this is the handwriting of the creator of the term legal definition genocide. And you know that man, Raphael Lemkin, he was the creator of the genocide uh, definition. So he was actually Polish Jew. So uh, he emigrated to the uh, United States and he, and he was the creator of the uh, genocide definition. And I found myself his handwriting in New York in, in Columbia Library. Uh, there is his writing, handwriting, how he was trying you know, to put two different words together to make a definition, ne neologism, it's called neologism genocide. And you know that Jena is, uh, I believe, a Greek term and side is Latin term. So Jena is a tribe and side is to kill. So that is the, the combination, yes? So this word, uh, word of genocide is very powerful. It's very, very powerful. And I think that is the reason why Lithuania decided to go with it because uh, genocide definition is the only legal definition which addresses the group's right to exist. Remember that, group's right to exist. None, none of any other legal definition, international legal definition of crimes is not doing that. Crimes against humanity are individual. Uh, war crimes are individual. Aggression is something different. So only genocide addresses the group's right to exist. So all those groups who suffered uh, as a group, they are going with a uh, genocide definition. So Lithuania was one of them to do that. So uh, I have a movie uh, for you to see, uh, to link that with the Ukrainian uh, uh, problematic, but we will see the movie a, a little bit later. Now uh, let's focus on Lithuania, what happened in Lithuania and why we are talking about that. So. What Lithuania did with that genocide de definition, you know, what steps we did. So you can see here the timeline. Yes, I already mentioned you that uh, genocide convention was adopted 1944, uh, 48. Then uh, in 1959, we had European Court of Human Rights and which became actually the, the arena of memory wars in Europe after 1990s. And especially after 9 2004, when uh, many Eastern countries joined uh, United, uh, European Union, yes, 19, uh, 2004. So in 1990s, Lithuania only um, uh, restored its independence and started to seek at least symbolic justice and challenge false narratives about what happened in Lithuania during Soviet time. Then in 2015, we had first case regarding Soviet genocide in Lithuania uh, in, uh, in the European Court of Human Rights. And we lost that case, seven by nine, eight by nine. So it was grand chamber and we lost it. And we lost it. And uh, that was uh, Wasilauskas against Lithuania case. And the, question, the main question in that case was why killing of partisans, Lithuanian partisans should be considered as genocide. And the main question in the grand chamber was why partisans were so important to Lithuania why you are claiming that Lithuania suffered, suffered genocide? Because, you know, Soviets killed only partisans and partisans are not that group protected uh, by the genocide convention. So we failed to prove that in 2015. But in 2019, we, we had second uh, case uh, on that. It was drilling Lithu uh, against Lithuania case. And again, the question, why partisans were important to national group? So now we are getting back to the genocide definition we had before. We needed to prove in Jelinga's case that partisans were the part of national group, important part of national group, of Lithuanian national group, and killing them and deporting them, killing them was genocide action against Lithu uh, Lithuanian nation in, in general. So this is the timetable. Uh, let me give you uh, some uh, main facts, uh, what happened there. So you can see the guy uh, with the eagle on his shoulder. 
shoulder, yes. So this is a Lithuanian partisan leader. Uh, Lithuanian partisan leader, uh, his nickname actually is Managas, it's named uh, uh, Eagle. So that's how he ended up, you know, with the eagle on his uh, shoulder. So this is something very symbolic. And um, now we are talking about Drelinga's case, the last case of 2019. So this is a uh, Lithuanian partisan leader, um, Vanagas, and he was uh, murdered, uh, captured and murdered eventually in Lithuania in 1956. So during Soviet time, when partisan uh, warfare was already uh, starting to fade, it was our partisan war was uh, almost over. So our Lithuanian uh, partisan leader, uh, um, how, what was the, his name? Now I just cannot remember, but um, Adolfas, Adolfas Managas. Uh, so uh, Adolfas Managas, and he was uh, killed, uh, captured and killed by the Soviet um, troops. So uh, not troops, but NKVD. So the second question, uh, the second person you can see in the photo, I think you might guess who is this. It's not Managas, it's not the same person. It's the person who was participating in capturing operation. He, he is Drelingas. Uh, 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 his name is Stanislavas Drelingas and he was sentenced in Lithuania, in Lithuanian national courts for committing genocide by capturing a Lithuanian partisan leader that he committed genocide action. And uh, he complained to European Court of Human Rights. Uh, he complained that, uh, saying that, you know, guys, I'm not happy with the national courts of Lithuania because they sentenced me for the crime, which is not the crime at the time I made it. I mean, in 1956, 1956, I was not aware I was making genocide. You know, that principle of nullum uh, crimen sine lege, no uh, crime without the law. So he was claiming that. And he was going by the um, Article 7 of the European Court of, of the Convention of, Euro, uh, of the European uh, Convention of Human Rights. So that. Article 7 prohibits sentencing persons for an um, action which was not a crime uh, during that time when the action was made, was, de uh, was done. So Delingas was claiming that he, and he was saying, come on, it was, not, uh, it was not genocide at that time in 1956. So you can see uh, the whole uh, list of main facts, what happened there. So uh, Delingas was actually, uh, KGB officer, yes, and uh, he was uh, attending, he was participating in the detention operation of uh, Adolf Vanagas. So he was claiming he could not know that his action could be punished as for genocide in 1956. But uh, very nice, now we have the ruling of the European Court of Human Rights of 2019 on this case. So the court said, so the first thing the court said that partisans were the essential part of Lithuanian nation, the actions against them, which eventually caused their death, torture of uh, Vanagas and then killing him, were genocide in, of Lithuanian nation in part, uh, at least since 1956. And the complicity in genocide was also punishable in 1956. So how the court shifted from the first case in 2015 to the 2019, yes? How did it happen in four years? So I must say that in second case, we had better position uh, in time frame. I mean, because in that case, you remember, it, uh, the action took place in 1956. And uh, maybe some of you know, or maybe not, but uh, Genocide Convention was already in force by that time. So Genocide Convention was adopted in 1948. It was, uh, it became, in, it uh, got in force only in 1951. Yes, 1951 when 20 countries ratified that, but not in Soviet Union. 
just guess at what time um, Soviet Union ratified uh, genocide convention? It was not 1951. You know that Stalin dead, uh, died in 1953, so it must be after 1953, yes? So um, it happened only in 1954. So, you know, everything was in line, in force. There was no um, problem with the, another principle of international criminal law, which is called lex retro non agit. Yes, retroactivity problem. So there was no retroactivity problem in Drelinda's case, but we had that problem in Vasilowska's case because the action took place, I believe, in 1949 or, or somewhere in between. But I mean, it was not ratified, definitely was not ratified uh, in Soviet Union yet. So, you know, it was like for the Strasbourg court, it was very hard, you know, to overcome that, uh, that particular issue on Lex, ret uh, lex uh, Retro Non Agit, uh, retroactivity issue as we call it. So this is basically uh, the ruling of the um, uh, court of uh, uh, European Court of Human Rights. And I must say, we were surprised about that. We were surprised about that because we were sure that you know, in the, sec the second case, we'll follow the first case, which we failed because it was Grand Chamber and everything. So we were surprised about that case, that we won that case. So this ruling is actually the first and only ruling by the, any international court saying and recognizing that Soviet genocide happened in the region. So, that what Soviets did during Soviet time, some of the crimes can be recognized as genocide. This is the first time and the only. No one else did that. So when I am talking with my Polish colleagues or Ukrainian colleagues, they are you know, fascinated. They are telling, asking me how you did that. So I said, you know, it's like 30 years. It, it took us literally 30 years to get there. So. Um, this is uh, the combination of uh, political and legal efforts to do that Be because we, you know, we uh, made a lot of legal uh, regulations uh, regarding that. Then we made, you know, uh, to the U European Union and to the European Council, we made, became the part of the European Council and became the part of the European Court of Human Rights. And we could deliver the cases in the uh, court of European Court of Human Rights. Uh, rights. So this is something that uh, we eventually did it, but it was extremely hard. And of course, after that case, we had uh, very uh, unsatisfactory comments from Russia. It's normal, I guess. Yes, to, to get those comments. So uh, and now you know that uh, Russia is again out of European Council. Yes, uh, out of European Council for the second time. For the first time, they were out after Crimea occupation for five years. They came back in 2019, and now they are out again. So, of course, Russia will not implement that ruling. Of course not. But this is crucial uh, and symbolic uh, gesture for the victims of Soviet crimes. Not only in Lithuania, not only in Lithuania. It's of course uh, Katyn in Poland, uh, then Estonia, Latvia, Georgia, Belarus, uh, Ukraine, all that region. And even I think uh, uh, Eastern Germany at some point, I am not sure, but maybe. But this is something you know that um, was never, uh, Russia was never accountable for what it did after the World War II, because it was among the winners, you know. We had no Soviet Nuremberg. We had no Soviet Nuremberg. We had, you know, we had dealt uh, with all the Nazi crimes, but not Soviet crimes. So what we see now in Ukraine, it's the um, continuation of uh, what was uh, not resolved uh, after the World War II and after the 1990s. Because um, all those, um, uh, how to say, uh, all those, uh, um, developments we see right now, they are very much linked with the crimes which were not addressed at that time when the Soviet Union collapsed. They were not addressed. 
And of course, Lithuania was among the leaders to claim that, you know, to equalize Nazi crimes and Soviet crimes. Yes, you know that initiative, I believe some of you might heard, but the European Commission and European other European countries were, how to say, reluctant to do that. And it's normal because we hadn't had any voice to tell our story for 50 years. You know, nobody knows about that. So I'm very grateful for ALPIS Network to tell you the story and to tell the story from legal perspective as well, because this is legal perspective, very much legal perspective happening right now. And of course, a lot of evaluation needs to be done from legal history perspective, because we need to evaluate what happened, you know, 50, now not 50, 70, 80 years ago, and now we don't have any cases, uh, pending cases, because perpetrators are dead. That's it. They are dead. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it, they are not there anymore. So um, now we don't have any uh, option, uh, but, you know, to stay with this, uh, with this ruling. And I'm sure you heard about the Armenian uh, attempt to recognize genocide. And, you know, they have the problem of retroactivity, because genocide in, um, in Armenia it uh, happened even before, during the World War I, some, some in, in that space, yes. So, and genocide convention only after 30 years. But as I mentioned for you, uh, genocide, word, genocide is very powerful word because it reflects the right of a group to exist. And um, Armenians, how did the Armenians recognition uh, of genocide only political? Yes, not legal. You know, you know that United States already uh, confirmed, recognized uh, genocide against Armenian nation uh, recently. I believe last year it was. So only political way. But Lithuanians succeeded to do that in legal way. So this is crucial to do that because we are seeking symbolic justice. We are not seeking, you know, reparations or something like that. We are seeking simply that the perpetrator must be named and the victims must be recognized. Like you are the victim of Soviet genocide and we know that and we respect you. So, and then how we can move on, yes? Then how we can move on. So how Lithuania moved on. This is the state funeral, even before Drelinga's case, the ruling of Drelinga's case in Vilnius in 2018 of Adolfus Vanagas because his body was found only in 2018 in secret cemetery. Secret for like, uh, nobody knew where he was buried in Lithuania. So we found him. I mean, we found and identified his body and we had a state funeral uh, uh, in 2018, even before the Drelinga's case. So this is how Lithuania moved on and we are still and we are moving even further uh, as you can see but um, in order for any other uh, country in our region to move forward this is also crucial you know to came to come in the terms with your past just you know you need to find a way how to heal and legal way is perfectly fine also to heal so this is uh, the movie I would love also you to, uh, to see. Uh, of course, uh, this movie, it's very short. It's YouTube, uh, YouTube movie by uh, uh, Radio Freedom, you know, Radio Svoboda. So it's a reliable source. It's nothing, it's nothing, you know, propagandistic or something like that. So if you want, I am putting you in the chat the link. It's two minutes. Uh, it's two minutes and uh, we can watch uh, the movie uh, all together and uh, then I will be open for you for the question because I'm sure you will have many related issues to ask. So um, let's watch the movie if you are okay. You received the link? Yes. Okay, so uh, what I'm I am always telling to my students like this, like, Three, two, one, beginning. <laughs> okay. Dating fattened. War in Ukrainian history. When Ukraine. Okay. 
Uh, I'm sorry to, to, to interrupt, but uh, Professor Vasco sent me uh, an email and he apologized because he couldn't make it because he had some personal uh, 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 affairs to, uh, that he couldn't postpone, okay? I wanted to say that, no problem. Thank you for the not notification. You know, when I am showing this movie to my students, they are usually get very, um, how to say, sensitive. Yes, and it's normal because this is, uh, uh, I don't know, awful things to see. Yes, those uh, bodies, those persons suffering. And um, why I'm showing this? But I think that, how to say, you cannot escape reality. Yes, it's nice to watch Netflix all the time, you know, and to be in artificial reality. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, we need to face reality, what's happened there. So I'm encouraging all, all the time my students to do that, not to be ignorant, yes? So why I'm showing this movie? Because um, you see, already heard that since 2006, uh, Holodomor is uh, uh, recognized in some countries as genocide, Holodomor, yes? So um, this is very hard topic for Ukrainians. And uh, this is even harder to speak about Holodomor right now, that uh, now what we have now in Ukraine at the moment, you know, the blockade of uh, the ports and not only uh, hunger uh, may come to Ukraine, but also to the uh, Middle East and Africa, because Ukraine is actually delivering all, those, all that food, uh, grain, to those regions. And without that, grain uh, on the refugee crisis, next refugee crisis can be just, you know, around the corner. So I don't want you to be, how to say, focused only uh, on um, very small, narrow things. You can see that everything is going and developing and going around and linked. Yes, it's not that something irrelevant. So Holodomor is not officially legally recognized as genocide, not yet. Of course, because you know Ukraine has much more things to do right now. They don't cannot focus on that. Yes, but Holodomor is um, actually um, Holodomor is actually uh, has the best chances. Uh, I'm sorry, I will need to to go to calm down my kid. So again, I'm, uh, my apologies, I'm, you know, with my kids today at home, so this is sometimes challenging to do, but it's fine now. So um, what is happening, so Holodomor was ne is never been, has never been <clears throat> recognized as genocide legally, but it, it has uh, best chances to, to be recognized 
And uh, what we need for that? We need legal historians. We need legal historians to explore what happened at that time using legal history methods because prosecutors are not able to do that. I mean, prosecutors are not able to do that. It's actually, it's impossible to do that because if you as a prosecutor will be reading a document like some report written by Soviet time, you need to know how to read it because it can be mix of disinformation, diminishing falsification of facts. And you know, this is something you need to have like a legal history background to understand how to interpret the facts and what facts are real and not real. So, and to make a case of it, yes. So uh, Holodomor is actually the, it has the best chances to be uh, recognized. And Katyn, you know, Katyn massacre in Poland. So this is something that uh, Polish uh, colleagues are also, you know, trying to do, but uh, it's not happening right now. They are still struggling to find out the uh, way to do that. Uh, how to explain the Katyn massacre, yes. So they are, you know, you can see the wording, Katyn massacre, not, not genocide, Holodomor, not genocide. This is something, you know, to name it, to title it. So just to you know, to, uh, how to say, to, um, uh, to see it, to spot it, how to name it, how to title it, how to define it. So still, Ukraine and Poland are still looking for um, titles, how to call that. But then legal historians can join and to make the case from that. So uh, I think I already uh, did, my, uh, did my part. So uh, waiting for your uh, comments, uh, remarks, whatever you want to say for me. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> have you heard something new? My, 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 my first question is, have you heard something new? This is, that would be, you know, the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, benefit if you heard something new. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and thank you very much for this excellent uh, presentation. It, it, it was really thrilling and, 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 uh, was it extremely interesting to, to, to learn about these things. And a question that came to my mind, which is a little bit off topic possibly, because it's not really uh, connected with these uh, Soviet uh, style uh, crimes, is whether there is a similar discussion concerning uh, the German crimes during the, the Second World War. I mean, is there any sort of, um, um, uh, you said there was a discussion about establishing a sort of relation between the two of them but is there a specific discussion about the the, the german responsibility or is that quite clear so that no one really has to talk about that because it's obvious um well you did a good job after world war ii you already i mean germans did a very good job by uh, by, you know, acknowledging uh, Nazi crimes and you did perf, I mean, it was, it was, it is an example, you know, how to do that. And you had Nuremberg, yes. So you had Nuremberg trials, one thing. Another thing in, um, uh, in the 60s and in the 70s, you had wonderful, wonderful historians and lawyers who were dealing with that uh, field. You had it. So you had like, you know, after one generation of the war, your, I don't know, maybe your parents, yes, in 60s and 70s, maybe your parents, they uh, understood and uh, they acknowledged that what Nazis did, yes, Nazis did, Nazi government uh, did, was wrong, yes? And you were coping with that, you know? You were paying reparations, you were investigating what happened and why happened, yes? Uh, what was the reason of it? So everything was what um, Nazi Germany, uh, Nazi German uh, Germany crimes in our region. I mean, in, in the occupied region in Lithuania, it's more or less uh, how to say uh, not so uh, painful for us because it was like three years, you know. So it was three years, and in Lithuania, 
for instance, the target was not, were not Lithuanians, Jewish. Jewish were the target. So I haven't heard about Nazi crimes, uh, discussion, Nazi crimes in Lithuania during three years of occupation since 1941 till 1944. Of course, I heard about the administration, what happened there. Of course, there was restrictions in judiciary and everything. It was, you know, occupied also. But the target of Nazi crimes was, were Jews in Lithuania. And then we have a problem because Lithuanians helped Nazi Germany to kill Lithuanian Jews. So that's where we have a problem. And this is the problem we are still facing. Why? Because even some of Lithuanian partisans were committing crimes um, against Jews. So now we have this problem because I'm saying that some, we had 20,000 partisans and only it is estimated from five to 10%. Partisans were, you know, those persons who were part, uh, who were some of them who were participating in killing Jews during the Nazi, um, Nazi occupation, then they, they went to uh, partisans, uh, joint partisans. So that's what's happened. And then we have a problem, like very big problem about that narrative that Lithuanians, you know, uh, Lithuanian partisans were uh, bandits, uh, Nazis, collaborators, um, killers. So we have that problem because, you know, of course, Soviet, um, Soviet propaganda used that and very in a good way, I mean, in a very, how to say, they managed that very well. I mean, this is, this is uh, like an example of perfect, um, of perfect, uh, uh, of perfect dissemination of uh, some narratives. And Lithuania was not uh, telling their own story, but we must admit that our own story needs to be still, how to say, balanced. You know, we still need to balance it. So I hope I, I answered your question in, in quite a detail. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I was wondering if there was some sort of uh, 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 partisans that were fighting against German army and the, the, the Germans no, pretty much no, the same thing. Uh, that... not, no, as far as I know, maybe there was some because I'm not, mm. you know, the expert on that particular issue. Right. But uh, I, I, I must say that, you know, German occupation was seen as a liberation from Soviet occupation. Ah, okay. On a chance to get again independent. So that's why, you know, this, this was, is, this is very complicated uh, combination okay. of our yeah. expectations and the real uh, plans of Nazi Germany. Yes. So, uh, so this is, uh, so I, as I mentioned, Nazi occupation was not so pain painful for Lithuanians, like right. 50 years of Soviet occupation. So to this regard, I cannot, uh, I cannot recall any, you know, initiatives on that, uh, on that, uh, uh, on that particular issue. Maybe if I, you know, Google it a little, maybe I will find something, but it's not, um, it's not in the, in the scope at the moment. Right, I see. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Kudri, for your for your for your nice um, for your nice question. Because um, actually, I must tell that uh, every time I represent the topic of Soviet genocide, I always get that question: What you will do with your partisans who were killing Jews? So how you will how you will balance that? So that's uh, I don't know. Maybe that's next next step to do: How to balance those stories? Jewish people in Lithuania who were killed by Nazi Germany and and, and uh, collaborators in Lithuania and uh, and the story of our own genocide which we faced. So this is yeah, it's extremely difficult. It's beyond law. It's something I don't know law, police, politics, then sociology, psychology. I don't know what else. <laughs> what else? This is something very. Uh, interdisciplinary, I think. So any more questions? Uh, yes, please. Yes, yes, uh, yes, I have some. Uh, so uh, as I can see from your answer to Professor Germanman, you don't have the two meaning of the concept of partisans or what I mean. Here in, in Central Europe, we, we have the uh, concept of partisans, of course, 
but we use that for for peoples fighting in the forest against the Germans uh, in the side of the Russian or Soviet army, even if the Soviet army is still in very far from this region. So mm -hmm. if you don't have this concept, then I can see the, the, the meaning of partisan that you, you used. However, if you have this concept, then how do you deal with that uh, in scholarly or in, in uh, common language? So, well, we have the German partisans, we have the Soviet partisans, we have the yeah. communist partisans, etc. So it, it, it gets to yeah. be confusing a little bit. And for, uh, as a consequence of the same question that how do you, how do you face the, the, um, the taking revenge of partisans, either they are killing Jews or not, Mm -hmm. uh, because I just the the movie with Daniel Craig Defiance just came to my mind uh, with the, the taking revenge of a, of a, a collaborating village uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the third question is that how do you do methodologically the the separation between uh, history law and politics because you yeah. said uh, because you said that is just perfectly my opinion as well that. Uh, um, um, uh, um, not a normal, but um, a proper uh, prosecutor cannot read historic texts because they cannot travel in time. Mm -hmm. However, we have a great, we as lawyers or prosecutors or whoever, apart from historians, uh, so uh, current law has a great advantage uh, in this case because with the principle of nebis in idem, so that uh, an issue, uh, a case cannot, um, uh, you cannot sue two times for the same yes. uh, case. However, a historian can anytime rewrite the story or the narrative. So uh, if, if you say that historians should take their part and it is overwhelming by current law, then we will have the fight of narratives even uh, especially with the narrativist atom bomb, mm -hmm. atomic bomb, so everything is relative, basically, just plainly. Or mm -hmm. we have the legal, we, we have the legal restoration of justice while the sentence is said, and that's it. So, and in the first case, as time passes, we will have an, a new a reinterpretation, a re reinterpretation. So that's how uh, the story will never end. However, with legal terms, uh, it can be uh, solved. So the question is, or the remark is that, uh, can you see um, a sort, um, an intersection between law and history to solve the problem? Because if it's in the hands of historians, it will never be solved because time will pass and interpretation yes. will pass. Yes. And uh, I think these are my questions and okay. remarks. So I will start from the first one uh, on the title, yes, of the concept of the partisans. So, um, of course, uh, in Lithuania, we also know Soviet partisans, yes, uh, we know those. Uh, then, uh, but it's not confusing for us in our region because uh, our partisans, uh, we call them Lithuanian partisans, of course, like, you know, explicitly. And of course, there is a, another an acronym for them like Forest Brothers. This is another one. But but this is something in the folklore, you know, in the in the in the in the in the, in the like in the vocabulary of the society. But we still but we already have a very strong legal concept of partisans. Lithuanian partisans. Who were Lithuanian partisans? why they were so important to Lithuanian nation. So uh, we had a ruling of Lithuanian constitutional court. Uh, I don't remember at, or at which, which ruling it was, maybe it was 2014 or earlier, it could be earlier even. Um, but what I mean, our constitutional court uh, was um, uh, argumenting and uh, motivating that partisans were uh, the very essential part of Lithuanian nation and because they were protecting Lithuanian nation from the aggressor and they were representatives of real Lithuanian government. I mean, not the installed, in, not the 
uh, government, which was uh, here in Lithuania, made by Soviet Union, you know, we, we had, you know, like independent country and something like that, yes, the member of the Soviet Union, but that government was not, um, how to say, was not representing Lithuanian nation. Only the partisans were representing Lithuanian nation. And the main motive on that, legal motive, I'm talking about, about legal now, uh, legal motive of, on that was uh, in 1949, in 1949, uh, on 16 of February, it was the celebration of uh, 31 year of Lithuanian independence. Uh, so Lithuanian partisans, the leaders of Lithuanian partisans adopted a declaration where they actually all the partisans, there was a structure of partisans, you know, in different areas of Lithuania, there was some leaders and everything. So they made a meeting and they uh, signed a declaration where they actually declared who, who they are and why they are together. I mean, and what they are doing. And they were actually based on the uh, principles of international law you know, the principle of self-determination, yes, self-determination of, of state, yes, to be independent and to determine its own destiny and way of life and everything. So this is uh, the document. I think it was, uh, it is already translated to uh, English as well. I can find it easily for you in, in Google and may, uh, put it in the chat. So on this document, our constitutional court already motivated and, argum uh, and argumented uh, what, who were the partisans and why they matter. And that argumentation went to European Court of Human Rights and it was approved. I mean, it was like in Drelinga's case. I mean, in Drelinga's case, we needed to explain exactly that thing and we did it. And it was, of course, I don't want to go to, to specific details. This, uh, uh, of, uh, you can find the Drelinga's case very easy in, in, in internet and, and, uh, and, uh, and to figure out, but this is something very hard to say, dense argumentation, very strict argumentation. I mean, the argumentation, which was very, very legal. It was not, you know, political or something like that. So the concept of partisans in Lithuania, they have a very big role in our statehood, statehood history, yes? So they were the representatives of the independent Lithuanian statehood, not occupied by the Soviet, but the independent Lithuanian statehood. I don't know, like, uh, like you have uh, uh, some, uh, uh, some countries have the um, uh, uh, opposition in exile, yes? Because they cannot work in, 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 in the country, for instance, in Belarus, yes? No opposition can stay in the country no longer. So Lithuanians had the opposition in the country and those of that opposition were, were partisans because they were representing and they were supported, very important thing, were supported by Lithuanian nation. They were supported. I mean, they got uh, food supplies, they got, cover got coverage and everything. They, they were supported heavily by some uh, regular people. But were they were they elected somehow earlier no. as the no. governments in were, exile because no. No. because in this case uh, anyhow I appreciate the the yes. the argumentation and the reasoning and anyhow it can be legal for me it's unimaginable that the combating force can have legal uh, legal recognition even if it's the European Court of Human yes. Rights yes. so for me it's a, a little bit yes. um, yeah. uh, meta heuristic argumentation yeah of course. Uh, I can, you know, this is uh, this is completely understandable that it it might look like this. Uh, and uh, as a legal historian, I am not into so deep into those details. Uh, what you are mentioning now, then this is already the uh, field that I need to uh, work on more uh, to address all the questions. But still, um, this is very. Uh, uh, that's why I'm saying a lot of questions are related. Yes, when we are talking about this case. We are talking about everything like statehood, international law, whatever. You, this is a comp complex issue. So, um, of course, they were not elected, but they, um, uh, as far as I know, they had a, a, an oath. I mean, like an oath, like in the army. Yes. 
So it was uh, an oath for Lithu to Lithuanian Re uh, Republic, not to the Soviet Re Lithuanian Republic, but to uh, independent Lithuanian Republic. Then they have the uniform. I mean, like uh, the signs of, of uh, recognition as a Lithuanian independent partisan or soldier, how you call it. So these are, those all issues are actually reflected in, in the case. Let me move to the second question. Can you remind me a little bit? Because the second question was uh, was quite complicated to me. Uh, it's a just just the the proportion of history, law, politics, and in the reasoning. Because in legal reasoning, you can have a sentence and you can be finished. And but if it's in the hands of uh, historiography or history, then yeah. uh, it will be a never-ending story as politics will oh, change yeah. uh, through time. So yes, uh, actually this case, Relinga's case we are uh, talking today, um, it is very much uh, the example of what happened, what should happen between historians and lawyers, but it didn't happen. So in this case, it didn't happen. And uh, why I'm telling this. So as a lawyer, as a lawyer and you as a lawyer, you are always very accurate with definitions, yes? like. We know that the definition of genocide means that. And if you want to claim genocide, please prove it. I mean, all the legal elements, please prove it. And if you see uh, political crimes, historical cl claims that genocide happened there and there, in legal field, it doesn't mean anything. In legal field, it doesn't mean anything. So my job, my job during a Fulbright in New York, what I did, I was trying, I was trying to using historical facts, which were already confirmed by many historians and, you know, like confirmed and settled, using those facts to put them on genocide definition framework. I mean, to see does what historians did does it fit genocide definition? Does it fit? Yes. So uh, in the partisan case, in the partisans case, uh, we already have an answer. It fits. Yes, it fits because uh, 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 we had national courts. We had a, uh, have a, a, a ruling of uh, European Court of Human Rights. But another thing which is which is very important is that I asked those judges, judges in Lithuania who were dealing with that case in national court, I asked them, have you approached any historian for you, you know, to, to put everything what was done in, in the historical field to put in legal terms, in legal argumentation? Because this is something, you know, needs to be translated between those two disciplines, yes? So, um, and they said, no, they said, no. What does it mean? It means that one thing, Lithuanian lawyers are very good and capable to read historical books and to get what they need from the historical books in legal terms. But I think if there would be the help of historians, there would be more, uh, how to say, uh, more clarification, even more clarification, yes? Because for instance, when I was preparing my papers, I found some mistakes. So for instance, in numbers, some information was already old, historical information, you know, it was already old, uh, dated. So there is a new sources uh, to prove some parts of the legal uh, definition of a uh, genocide. So this is what I encountered. And um, so the partisans, we have more or less clear uh, situation, like at this stage, more or less, yes, because this is, uh, of course, there are many questions, as Rigo said, uh, to be uh, uh, questioned. But what about deportations? What about deportations? Because, you know, in the genocide, uh, we have a definition of, uh, uh, I can show it to you right, right now. Uh, we have a definition which can be, uh, which can be actually um, done uh, regarded um, as genocide. And you know that definition, I will uh, like this, this one. Deliberately inflicting the group conditions of life calculated to bring about a physical destruction in whole and in part. So my next step was to 
read historical papers, historical facts, historic, historical books, and to see does Soviet deportations fit the genocide definition of this act? Yes. And uh, I, I made a paper of that and I published last year uh, with the Brill uh, that paper. So, you know, I found everything what I needed. I mean, in historical, historical background, I found every uh, legal element of genocide de definition, but it's not enough. It's not enough because we need uh, also the prosecutor's work. I mean, we need an acting case. Yes, we need an instrument. We need an acting case to go into deeper and to verify because this is only a research. This is only the framework. Yes. So that's all we can do. I mean, nothing more we can do. Like, I am legal historian. This is this is the the maximum I can do. And when if there will be any case, any case on that, maybe some prosecutor will open that paper and and see that I already, you know, uh, did half of prosecutor's job, but now for him is the task to find all those elements in individual case. And it might be even diff more difficult because I am, you know, talking about the framework, yes? Like explaining things and elements in general, but not in individual case. And when you have individual case, even more proofs needs to be done. So we don't have any individual case anymore pending on Soviet deportations as genocide uh, because all perpetrators are gone now and uh, I won't, don't see those um, cases happening. But what we have right now, we have deportations from Ukraine to Russia. You know that. And we have even um, even more we have the last act of genocide, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. This is huge. This is huge, you know, because this is already like in front of our eyes. Because what is the main protection of genocide? The survival of a group. And if you are bringing kids of that group to another group, those kids will, will, will be, you know, uh, not lost, but uh, they will be, uh, they will lose their identity. So this is this is the case. So that's why Raphael Lemkin put all those actions in genocide uh, definition. And this is something that's happening right now. So uh, I hope a little bit, so this is my practical answer because I am really doing that, what you are saying. <laughs> I am really doing that, trying to do that, but of course, with every individual case, it will be different. I'm just giving theoretical background from history and legal perspective, but not on the individual case. The prosecutor need, will still need to do this, his job. Of course, he or she can ask me how to read some documents, how to find that, those documents in our house, how to prove some elements. But uh, of course, individual case can be completely different completely different. So thank you, Rigo, for your questions. Thank I'm you. happy you asked. <laughs> so maybe everyone are already tired. No, I think that already you are tired. <laughs> this is a hard topic, you know, it's a very hard topic. Well, in any mean? case, oh, excuse me. <laughs> no, uh, Dr. Parajo, would you like to, to ask a question? Oh, it's fine after you <laughs> and, and it's just a very very short one i don't know possibly it's 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 again uh, um a little difficult but but um, i was wondering um if you could could say as far as the time frame is concerned the period where where this genocide happened um, i mean for genocide this subjective element the intent to destroy is 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 uh, indispensable okay. So is there a period where you could say this intent um, can be proven? Was it just the, the, the Stalin era or was it still under Khrushchev? Or, yeah. or is it well, sort of gray areas where it's a little bit more difficult to, to tell? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, uh, 
again, next step to do and to ask this question, um, but uh, I'm asking that question myself. Uh, was that genocide time frame, you know, since 1945 till 1990s? So, uh, and this is uh, something to um, to to, uh, to explore, but in my opinion, my personal opinion, what I can see right now, uh, Soviet Union, Soviet Union haven't, uh, how to say, when Stalin died, the goals of Soviet Union haven't changed. I mean, in general, yes, maybe the former, uh, the instruments changed a little, maybe there was not so, hard yes and of course then again uh, we have a uh, opposition in those uh, soviet republics yes we were adjusted you know adapting and trying you know to there is a, some many anecdotes about how lithuanians went to moscow with the with the um, uh, sausages and lithuanian vodka to bribe moscow uh, regulators not to do something what they wanted to do in lithuania so there are more, ma many stories not not anecdotes many stories about that how we needed to deal, you know, to in order to adapt and survive. So, of course, uh, after Stalin died, uh, some formats changed. Yes, uh, but the formats changed not because the goal of uh, Soviet Union changed, but because um, uh, uh, partisan war was uh, defeated in Lithuania. It's approximately in 1956. It's like. 1945, 1956, it's the longest in the region. In Latvia and Estonia, it was shorter. So in Lithuania, it was most, most the biggest resistance. Uh, that's why we uh, escaped Russification in the first decade, because it was very dangerous for Russians to come to Lithuania uh, because of the partisan war. And you know, in Ukraine, they are doing the same thing now. There is a partisan guerrilla war as well, not only a regular army, but guerrilla war as well. So it was very dangerous to Lithuania to came. So we avoided Russification for, for a decade. That was huge. Uh, another thing after uh, 56, in 1956, uh, partisan war was already over. And, um, and uh, of course, there was a there is an information that the last partisan was killed in 19, 1967. 1967. So even more, uh, one more decade. But you know, it was like where individual cases already, not the structure. Yes. So I think that. Um, so I think that yes, uh, the goal of Soviet Union haven't changed till the 1990s, but maybe the form changed. So. After the partisan war, it would be very hard from legal perspective to talk about genocide. Very hard. I, because you know, uh, deportations were over. Like in nineteen, uh, uh, last deportations were like in nineteen fifty six or so, eight or something like this. Uh, partisan war was over. So we uh, entered another stage, and that stage was of adapting, and we did it well. <laughs> I mean, we did it well. Of course, we, we still see the consequences, for instance, for legal nihilism, for cynicism, for everything uh, of that, but uh, we did it well. I mean, we survived <laughs> till now. So, uh, so different stages. I mean, this is a very good topic, actually, for our next research. This is the answer any scholar can tell when they don't know the answer. <laughs> they don't know the answer. <laughs> So thank you for your question. But yeah, next step, it could be, um, but it's again, it's not legal anymore. I mean, it would be something not legal to consider. So uh, Dmitrius, I think you had a question, yes? Yeah, thank you warmly. Merely not a question, just some some uh, words of, of, of thank you, I'd rather say. It's, 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 it's good to raise awareness uh, generally, and uh, you've given uh, many examples. Uh, you've mentioned also the Armenians. I'd also mention the uh, the fate of the the Greeks in Asia Minor, for example. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, uh, Nazi crimes, of course. Also, um, it's it's good to to know where we stand as uh, not only as Europeans. 
also considering, uh, I don't know, colonial crimes. That is also um, up to date um, yes. these days again. So it's it's always good to to know where we stand. It's uh, it's it's good to to uh, to fight um, any way of uh, forgetting these things. Um, mm -hmm. It's essential not only for the, for the European Union to know where it stands. And, uh, I'm not going to use the, the, the cliche phrase that um, if you don't know your past, uh, you're not going to have any sort of future, something like that. Um, but it is, it is uh, essential to raise awareness. So uh, thank you warmly for uh, your lecture. Okay. And uh, well, uh, I guess uh, we learned a lot today. Well I'm very happy to contribute to Elpis Network because I feel that uh, you're a very um, active uh, community and very um, impactful community. So I'm happy to, to be the part of, of this community. And I hope that we will see each other in the next uh, activities. So just um, maybe another thing to consider, just, you know, uh, we need to find a way how to um, not only how to survive but also how to tell our stories and to balance them all of them i mean Nazi germany greeks uh, armenians uh, you name it i mean we need we still need to learn how to to be in one space yes of course we are doing much better now than we did um, last time we are, we are doing much better now but of course some uh, states are still considering themselves colonial, imperialistic, and they are doing the thing they wanted to do. But um, I just hope that the Russia will find a way to, will find the bravery and strength, strength to uh, acknowledge uh, who they are and what, who they want to be. I just, this, this is my only wish. I think that that's, that's, you know, uh, that uh, war is uh, harming not only our region, but the Russia itself, a lot. I mean, they are suffering a lot from that. And, and uh, this, is, uh, this is very sad to see what's happening uh, there as well. So thank you again for, for, the, for the nice meeting today. Have a nice midsummer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. much. Thank you. It was a great pleasure to have you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank so thank you, you so much. Uh, yes. Oops.